All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Lasting Learning Podcast. You know, every week I try to introduce you to somebody new, somebody who has a lesson that we can all learn from, somebody who has overcome something, somebody that has transformed themselves or others, somebody that has just changed the game. And today, this week, no exception. I've got a guest on here who, to be honest with you, is on here to speak to me. She's on here to have a conversation with me to let me know how life can change, how life can evolve, and how you can overcome some things. She is a, a mom. She is an entrepreneur. She is a survivor. She is a thriver. She is somebody that has been in the dark, and now she's in the light. We've got a woman on here who is here to tell an amazing story of transformation, a story of self-care, a, a story of perseverance, a story of grit, a story that hopefully will change you. So join me in your car, at home, wherever you're listening, offer that little golf golf clap. Don't worry, nobody's watching you. Standing <laughs> ovation, whatever it is that you need to do for our guest today, Catherine Babcock. Catherine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, Catherine, you've got an amazing story of over overcoming. It's a story that has some twists and some turns and some some dark moments. It's a story that goes back a couple of decades, but it's a story that I'm happy to tell people has a happy ending because you're here today to celebrate that as well. But I want to start our conversation today with you kind of sharing your story, sharing who you are as a person and what is it that led you to this place in life today? Do you mind taking us back in time a couple of decades and walking us through your journey and your story? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I am a single mom of three kids who are not kids anymore. Um, I've got a son who's 30 now, a son who's 27 now, and a daughter who's 23 now. And amazingly, they've all made it to adulthood. I made it to them becoming adults, which we none of us can believe. Um, but it started back in May of 1993 when I had my first son. And, you know... I was a single mom. Um, I got pregnant at 18, had him at 19. Um, but I knew as soon as I had him, I knew I went to a, a home for single unwed teenage mothers while I was pregnant with him. So I had a couple of other friends who were having babies at the same time. And I knew that there was something different about my kid compared to the other kids in this home. And I moved out of the home, got my own place. Evan and I, you know, kind of went along for a little bit. And then I had my second son. And about three weeks after I had my second son, Evan tried to close his head in the door. And I knew that there was a problem. So we went to the pediatrician. Just, just to interrupt. Evan is the older son, correct? So Evan is you my had, oldest. You had Evan. And a couple years later, you had a younger son. I and did, Alex. Okay, so you have Evan, the oldest, and then Alex. Okay, carry on. I just wanted to make sure that I was tracking the timeline. That's okay. And then my daughter's Rebecca. She's the only girl. Gotcha. And so my son, Evan, um, I knew that there was something wrong. And we went to the pediatrician for a well visit, actually. And the pediatrician knew that there was something wrong as well. He suggested that we go see a psychiatrist because Evan's behavior was just all over the place. Always was from the day he was born. And... We went to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist diagnosed Evan with ADHD and bipolar at three years old. And way back then, you weren't diagnosed at that age. That was very uncommon. But we we went along and I had Rebecca and I was single mom again. Um, my ex is out totally out of the picture, never paid child support, never did visitation, never nothing. So it was just me and the kids. And Rebecca was born and everybody was happy to have a girl in the house. And we went along for a couple of years and there were multiple occasions of Evan being put in a psych hospital um, because of different things he would pull at school or he would pull at home. He at one point thought he was Buzz Lightyear and thought he could fly off a bookshelf at school. Um, different things kept going on. And so they kept precipitating these Psych these psychiatric hospitalizations and it just became routine to us but I was absolutely exhausted you're exhausted enough from caring for three kids on your own 
just in under the best of circumstances. But Rebecca, fast forward a couple of years, Rebecca was was diagnosed with bi- with borderline personality, bipolar, and ADD. So I have these two kids that have mental illness, and we got Rebecca um, diagnosed because she was cutting, and that was the first signal that there was something wrong or something going on with her. And so I was running between hospitalizations of Evan and running back home to deal with Rebecca, who would cut severely. And it was scary. I didn't know what I was doing. I would talk to her therapist. Her therapist told me that that was a quote, normal thing that girls did at that age nowadays. And I knew that that wasn't right. I knew that yeah, what, what age, what age was she? What, what age do you think are we looking? She's about 11. So you have an 11 year old who's cutting and you've got a teenage son who was in and out of hospitalization. You've got yes. a middle, a middle child who is watching all of this ensue. And then we've got exactly. you still, still a, a young, young mother, 30, young thirties, exhausted. Were you working at the time? No, I was actually disabled, okay. which adds kind of another facet to the story. So I was a disabled single mom, a chronic pain patient, um, because I, I was a paramedic. I blew my back out, had to have many back surgeries. So I'm dealing with this chronic pain, plus these kids that I can't get control over. I have therapists telling me to do that, you know, to do one thing. And then I have the elementary school or middle school telling me that that's wrong and that they're going to call social services on me. We had many, many calls to social services in the time that my kids were growing up. Um, it was, it was just a circus. My, and so, and, and so you're losing, you're losing your mind. I mean, literally figuratively all, I mean, I can only imagine, right. So no respite for you either. No, no, no relaxation. No you, you can't go to work to get away. To get away. You, you are, you're home. The phone is constantly ringing with somebody calling to complain. Somebody's showing up at your doorstep when the, the kids are home. Evan home, or yes, yeah, and it's constant. But- and and I and I can only imagine at times there's probably some embarrassment that goes along with this. There's probably some anger, anger and some resentment. Yes. I can only imagine that you're resenting the schools, resenting yes. the neighbors, yes. maybe even. And I I don't know if this is true or not. Maybe even resenting the kids a little bit for what a they've lot. done to you and your life. Right, I, a lot. I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining all of this. And at the same time, everybody else is just wagging their finger at you. Like if you would just follow our rules and just do it our way, everything would be fixed. Just listen. Absolutely. And we've got the script. Just do it. Absolutely. Everybody was telling me that. And I, one example sticks out in my mind that um, I was told Evan refused to take a coat to school when he was in elementary school. He's probably in fourth or fifth grade. And he refused to take a coat. We live in Denver, Colorado. So it's pretty cold during the winter. And I would fight with him to no end to try to get him to take a coat to school. And he'd finally take the coat and then he'd leave it at school so he didn't have to deal with it the next day. So it was just this rigmarole that we would go back and forth on. Well, the therapist said, natural consequences. If he doesn't want to take a coat to school, that's fine. Let him be cold. I did that, and the elementary school called social services on me for being a neglectful parent. So I'm trying to integrate what all these people are telling me that I need to do, but it's making somebody unhappy somewhere, and someone's calling social services on me, or someone's yelling about something. So I can't even keep the adults in our lives, and the school officials, and the therapists, I can't even keep everybody happy, much less mm. you know, try to deal with the kids. So it was... It was just insanity. It was total what, what, insanity. What's going on with your middle child through all of this? You know, Alex has always been a really great kid. He's always been kind of shy, kind of withdrawn, and he's always made great grades in school. He's never gotten in trouble. Um, he got in trouble one time because he got a bow and arrow for Christmas and went out. He and his buddy went out and shot a rabbit, and the neighbors were all up in arms because he shot the rabbit. Meanwhile, the the neighbors are all at the homeowners meetings complaining about the overpopulation of the rabbits that we have, but the right, but the neighbors just had a fit that he went out and shot one and I had to deal with the police. He had to go out and pick it up. It was just a mess. That's the only one and only time I can ever remember Alex getting in trouble ever. I think that story probably, yeah, I think that story probably is a great example of 
the perception that others had of you and your family, yes. right? It's we if it were. was any other kid or if it were the adults that went out and took care of the bunny, okay. But now it's that kid from that family, even the yes. good kid is a bad kid. And what is yes. that mom doing, making allowing her kid to have a bow and arrow? Those kids don't need to have bows and arrows. Those kids are bunny murderers. Yes. And so on and so forth, because perception yes. is driving the reality. And you're in the middle of it saying, come on, just let my kids be kids. kids let me yep. figure this out. I'm doing the best I can. And, you know, and we live in a in an upper middle class neighborhood. And it's not like I ever sent my kids to school in rags. It's not like I ever, you know, I was a strict mom on the on the continuum of of you know, laziness and strict. I didn't just let my kids run out and do whatever they wanted. I tried to have control over them, but we had problems like Evan would flush his medications or would stick them down the disposal. So Evan's being non-med compliant. Meanwhile, none of the adults can figure out why these medications aren't working. Well, then I find a stash of them in my garbage disposal. So it's, mm. it's insane. And Rebecca is continuing to cut. Then she moved into suicide attempts. So she began taking a, just a plethora of medications to try to commit suicide. And there was at one point, Dr. Dave, at one point, there was our, the ICU at our local hospital, there was a corner in the ICU. My son occupied one room. My daughter occupied the room right next to it in the corner. Rebecca was in there for a suicide attempt. Evan was in there for whatever obnoxious thing he had pulled and they had decided that he needed to be in there for observation so it was just in our our house was marked by the police um it's still i still have a red mark on my house but our house was marked by the police because evan would go out there with a bottle of lighter fluid and a lighter in the other hand and threaten the police to come on come pick him up and it was just i was out there screaming you know evan stop it don't do that we don't you know you don't do that and the, the neighbors are coming out of their houses and looking at us and it was just ridiculous. And so you fast forward to high school and Evan develops a heroin problem hmm. and that just almost did me in that almost did me in. Um, we, he started getting in more legal trouble because with heroin comes legal trouble. And he, at first, began stealing my medication as a chronic pain patient. I was on some pretty heavy narcotics. So he began stealing my medication, um, which I would call the police and turn him in, you know, and file a police report because I needed to get more medication because he had stolen it and sold it or taken it or whatever he did with it. So he moved on to heroin and there was at one point my dad died and my mom lived in the next town over from us. And when she would pick up a load from there and bring it, she decided she wanted to move back to Denver. So when she would bring a load up to Denver, Evan would go down to Castle Rock and steal uh, some things of my father's and pawn them. And then when she would come back to Castle Rock to pick up another load, Evan would get into her house in Denver and steal things from her house in Denver and pawn those things. So the problem with Evan is that Evan always kind of told on himself. And he told me what he was doing. And I told my mom, of course, what was going on. And I decided to call the police because I decided that he needed to learn a lesson that you don't steal. Well, I had no idea what that was going to lead to. Um, Evan, the police came out, took a report. We got, we managed to get my mom and I tracked everything down to the pawn shops that he used. We got pretty much everything back. But Evan started having to go to court. He was put on probation and part of the probation rules was that he had to turn in drug tests and he couldn't turn in a clean drug test. Every drug test he turned in was dirty for heroin mm -hmm. and he's disappearing from home for days. I don't know where he's going. I can't find him. So he would show up at probation, turn in this dirty drug test while we kept getting hauled back into court because he kept violating his probation. So we finally went to court one day and the judge said, you know, I'm a little tired of you turning in all these dirty drug tests and you thumbing your nose at the probation department. If you turn in one more dirty drug test, you're going to prison and you're going to finish the rest of your sentence in prison. I'm tired of this. And my mom and I told Evan, we sat him down and said, you know, look, you better 
figure something out. Let's put you in treatment. Let's do whatever we need to do to help you. But you cannot do heroin anymore. And he was like, whatever. The judge doesn't know what he's talking about. Just very blase about the whole thing. Well, Evan, sure enough, turned in another dirty drug test. And my kids and I were on our way home one day from McDonald's. And we were in my minivan. And we pulled into my parking space in front of my house. And I don't know how many officers and unmarked trucks and unmarked cars came barreling in behind us, guns drawn. We're all sitting in the car with our hands up, just scared to death. And Evan could care less. He kept eating whatever it was he got from McDonald's that day. And the police wanted Evan because he had an emergency court date because he turned in another dirty drug test. So we went to court. Um, Evan was of course, admonished by the judge. And the judge said, I told you, if you turned in another dirty drug test, you were going to prison. I wasn't kidding. So Evan was, sure enough, taken to prison that day. And no one in my family has ever been in legal trouble like this. No one in my family has ever been to jail, much less prison. And it was it was so embarrassing and it was so sad because at that point he was still my little boy. He had just turned 18 a couple of weeks prior. You know, he, he was just this wayward kid that I was so used to jumping in and bailing out. There was no bailing him out from this. And so he was sent to prison for three years. We spent all of our Christmases, all of our Thanksgivings, every Saturday driving to the different prisons. And he kept getting in trouble in the different prisons that he would be sent to. So they would send him to a different prison. And at one prison, he was green-lighted, which means kill on sight. And I had to call and deal with the warden, and we had to get Evan out of there. And it was it was still always something. And my other two were upset that we spent all of our Saturdays and holidays driving to these various prisons. Because it's a pain when you go to prison. You have to take all your piercings out. They put you through the metal detector. You know, there's they're very strict on what you're allowed to take in and what you're not. They charge you ridiculous prices in their vending machines. You know, it's it's ridiculous to try to talk to them on the phone because it's so expensive. So I'm trying to maintain this relationship with this 18-year-old. And he eventually got in with a gang of kids, kids, I, tw early 20s, and they started extorting me. And Evan was apparently doing drugs and telling them that I would pay for the drugs. And we started having people drive by our house at night. We started having people call me at all hours of the day and night because they wanted their money. And I had no idea any of this was going on. So Evan finally gets out of prison. Um, I find out what's going on with him telling everybody that I would repay his drug debts. And I called the... I don't remember who I called the warden or someone in charge of investigations and said, look, I'm being extorted for this money. I don't have $25,000 to give these people. And so Evan and this group of gang members that he was with were all charged with extortion and under the Colorado act that's similar to the RICO act, the national RICO act, it's called the COCA act in Colorado. So Evan was facing 50 years in prison when he was let out of prison the first time. And I went and used my life savings, got him a criminal defense attorney, um, was scared to death of what was going to happen to him. I didn't want him to go to prison for 50 years. And Evan actually got out of prison, totally turned his life around, worked two jobs, met a girl. They had a baby, they got married, everything was great. And then about six months into it, I'm on the phone with them and we're all supposed to meet down at the courthouse for this RICO act, this COCA act, these charges. And all of a sudden the phone goes dead. They had broken down and Evan had pulled his car off to the side of the road. And I'm talking to his wife about do I send you guys an Uber? Do I try to come pick you up? You cannot miss this court date. And all of a sudden the phone went dead. And I kept trying to call her back. She wasn't answering. 
I finally called Evan's phone and some guy answers the phone and says, well, there's a guy that's still unconscious and the lady is laying in the middle of the road screaming that her back hurts. And I couldn't comprehend what he was saying. I had just talked to his wife. Well, it turns out that a semi truck barreling down the interstate at 80 miles an hour didn't even hit their brakes and ran into Evan was looking under the hood of his car trying to figure out what was going on and um Kylina was on the phone with me trying to figure out a plan and they I'm sorry I have a puppy and the puppies decided that now was the time to play um and so uh Evan was looking under the hood and the trucker ran into the back of Evan's car, which ran over him. And then the semi truck ran over him and spit him 105 feet out the other side of the, the truck. So Evan was flight for life to the local trauma center. His wife was flight for life to another area hospital. Um, when we got finally got to the hospital, they told us to tell him goodbye that they didn't think he was going to make it through the night. Um, and he just looked so pitiful laying in that bed because remember he had really gotten it all together and was really doing what he needed to do at that point. And he was, he wound up being in a coma for 19 days. Um, he had broken almost every bone in his body. They were taking him to different surgeries to try to put different splints on, you know, screw him into the bone and all these different things. And when he came out of it, when he came out of his coma, he had to learn how to re talk and walk and everything again. It's not like you see on TV for the first month. He thought that his brother and sister were his kids. Um, he just couldn't, couldn't figure it out. And so I was the only caretaker there available for him. And the hospital urged me to get legal guardianship over him because his next of kin at that point was his wife but she's recovering in another hospital. So she can't make medical decisions for him. So I got legal guardianship and conservatorship over him. Um, I've since released the conservatorship when he settled with the insurance company, I gave them the conservatorship, but I still hold legal guardianship over him. Um, and it makes him so angry. He, he suffered a traumatic brain injury during this whole thing. And so while he was recovering, he was in the hospital for three months and then he refused to participate in therapy anymore. Um, and so there wasn't a whole lot that the hospital could do for him at that point, if he wasn't going to participate in therapy. So they sent him home and I was responsible for getting him to all of his appointments and working on with him on therapy modalities at home, trying to get him up to speed again to where he could cook something basic and he could walk up the flight of stairs that I have at the house. And we went to all different kinds of brain therapists. We had brain scans done, you name it, we went through it. And I was the only person there mm -hmm. to deal with, to deal with him and to help him. You know, he moved back in with me and unfortunately um, the accident did cause a divorce between the two of them because they just recovered at two different times and she couldn't, her, she broke her back, um, broke a couple vertebrae. She broke her, her uh, clavicle in several different places and she uh, dislocated a knee really severely. And so there was no way that she could help take care of Evan because he didn't even know who he was at that point. And I mean, truly he didn't know who he was. And so uh, we, I kept taking care of him. I brought him home from the hospital, tried to teach him all the things that he needed to know, but he was very angry. Part of the brain, um, the traumatic brain injury is, can be anger. Mm -hmm. And he was extremely angry when he came home. And would call me all kinds of names, would try to fight me out of his room. And he didn't have a lot of strength. So it wasn't like there was some big physical battle. You know, I mean, it, he was pretty puny. It, it sounds a lot like almost what you dealt with when he was four and five years old all over again, right? It's like it's exactly you went, like that. You went through this this roller coaster and you finally got into this place where you're like, okay, <laughs> I can breathe. He's he's out of this, he's overcoming it. And then he went through Man. this accident that 
had him resort back to who he was as a five and six year old. And now you're back to single mom mode, 100% again, trying to teach and raise this kid. Was there any part of you that thought, okay, it's a second chance or were you just exhausted saying, I can't believe I have to go through this again? I was just exhausted. I, I wanted to help him so badly. It was so entrenched in what can I do to help him? But I was just exhausted. I, I was just exhausted. You know, he would wake up in the middle of the night, very paranoid. That's another um, traumatic brain injury symptom is that they can become very paranoid. And he would wake up convinced that people were outside of the house trying to get in the house. I mean, it was just very, it was very scary. And is, is he, he still living in your house now? No, he actually has, we've gotten him his own townhouses, his own townhouse that's about three miles away from me. Um, and he just started driving recently, mm. which nobody said, everybody said he, that would never happen. No way. But he has done this. He was very, very injured for about four years. And then this miraculous healing came over him. I don't know how else to describe it. And he totally changed and now has, I went through a custody battle for his kids because her parents wound up with the kids after the accident. We picked them up the day of the accident and then her parents wound up with them and they tried to file papers against my son and his wife saying that um, they wanted to terminate parental responsibilities because of disabilities on the mom and dad's part. And I wasn't about that. That wasn't going to happen. So we launched a huge custody battle that lasted about two and a half years um, of different court dates and different court liaisons coming to visit and all these different people coming back and forth because I wasn't going to just give up on his kids. He needed to be able to see those kids. And he actually was court ordered um, visitation. So he's got the kids, he has to be supervised, but he's got the kids three days a week for a few hours at a time. Mm. So, it, and it then feels I like, be there to supervise. It, it feels like in, in this story of your life, a, the identity that you're carrying of always having to be the caretaker for somebody, always having to fight somebody, always trying to preserve the reputation and the perception of somebody, always fighting to, to make sure that your kids get a fair shake and that other people see your kids as the babies that you still see them as, as these kids with lots of potential. And yet through all this fighting, it seems like there's always somebody in the middle that's just kind of watching the entire thing play out, whether it's your middle child or now it's your kids' kids, your your grandkids that are always observing this. And it's got to be this this delicate balance that you're you're facing of trying to make sure that they can maintain their identity and their peace and not having to, to, to get caught in the drama. Yes. I'm wondering where you are right now in life. And we're going to fast forward just a little bit here. Are, are you at a place where it, you feel like you are still, your identity is still the fighter. You're still the mama bear. You're still the protector of identities. Are you, do you feel like you're, it's always fight or flight for you? Do you feel like you're always looking over your shoulder? Or are you at this place now where you can finally breathe? I can finally breathe. You know, hmm. Evan moving out on his own, being able to be independent for the most part. He calls me a hundred times a day for different things, but he, oh, I'm so sorry. The dog is chewing on it, um, but he, um, he's independent for the most part. And then we've got my daughter who's engaged and living with her fiance and she works full time. He works full time. They're planning for their wedding. And then we've got Alex who now works at a motorcycle shop um, full time and they're all doing great. And, you know, mm. I, I don't know what happened other than God decided that I had enough punishment because I, it is so different now. And I am so much happier now. And a lot of it comes back to realizing at one point that I was doing no one any favors by constantly being available to everyone for everything that mm. I, it finally resonated with me that you've got to take care of yourself before you're any good for anybody else. You know, I, I firmly believe that we all have a tank within us 
and the tank is full of love and good things. And every time we do for someone else or we give to someone else, part of that tank is depleted. But when we are given to or when someone does something nice for us or when we do something kind for ourselves, there's a little bit, the tank is filled up a little bit more. And you've got to work a balance between the, you know, to keep the tank level. And I feel like for so many years, my tank was just empty, was mm -hmm. just empty. But now I feel like because I practice self-love and self-care that now I feel like my tank is more full than it has been in 30 years. And I'm more capable of being a good grandma and a good mom and a good friend and a good, all of these different roles I play in my life because I feel like my tank is full. You know, it's, it's not just the self care that I practice, but it's, you know, also that my kids are not being brought home by the police all the time. And we're not going to psych hospitals all the time. And we're not, you know, all those things are done and yeah. it just makes such a difference to care for yourself. And I wish I had done that all along. And to, to play with that, the, the tank full analogy a little bit more, your, your story, you kind of re remind me more of a car battery than you do a car gas tank, you know, a, a car battery, every time it started up, it drains every time it started up, it drains, but when it finds its equilibrium and when it's running, it actually recharges itself. Right. Cause as, as you're telling me this, I'm also saying, okay, three kids are now out of the house. They're starting to make a life of their own. But at the same time, you now have a puppy that is on your lap, causing a little bit of chaos. And you're like, okay, but I got to care for this thing now. And now you, you've you got this other this other thing that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, the Sergeant Bubbles. And it's another thing. It's another little baby in your life that you got to take care of because yeah. you you I feel like there's a part of you that as long as you're humming and you're in control of when you're able to to give that love and give that that joy to others, it's okay because that kind of fills you up at the same time. But it's the, it the sudden start and stop. It's the start and stop that's unpredictable that you don't know it, it's coming. That can just be exhausting. It's the people always coming and just pulling from you as opposed to you pouring on them that gets right. draining. And now right. it's a choice on your part. And that makes all the difference in the world when it's your choice versus it being forced upon you. You know, it's it makes all the difference in the world. And I have repaired relationships with my neighbors. They all now mm. know that my kids are out of the house. And I've heard stories that my kids did different things while they were growing up that I had no idea about. It's no wonder my neighbors hated me. <laughs> but the neighbors now accept my kids. You know, they're really nice to my kids when they come over to visit. And it's it's just a di totally different world now. It's a totally different world now. And so yes, so what, does, what does your world look like now? So the kids are gone. Are you just sitting around <laughs> twiddling your thumbs playing with the puppy? Oh, absolutely not. No, because I decided in all of my brilliance at the beginning of the pandemic, um, May of 2020, I was still taking care of Evan, who was still living with me. And I had to do something for myself. I've always been very creative. I've, I've always been very into art and doing mixed media. And I decided I had to do something for myself because it just, I couldn't do this anymore. I could not focus solely on Evan anymore. So I, my daughter called me crying one day and said, mom, I've been laid off because of this pandemic. And I said, well, why don't you come over and we'll make soap? I said, I've got all this soap making equipment in my kitchen. I'd like to get my kitchen back, come over and we'll make some soap and we'll talk about, we'll figure out what you're going to do. So she came over, we spent four or five days making soap and bet different bath products. We gave them to everyone we knew, uh, literally everyone we knew. And we still had so much soap and so many bat, um, so many bath products remaining. And I didn't know what to do with them all. There were so many, I didn't know what to do with them. So I, um, I, she came to me and she said, mom, mom, I'd really like, this is, has been really fun. I'd really like to go into business with you. And I said, that'd be great. I'd love that. You know, let's get on it. So I spent the next couple of days um, getting business cards together, making an LLC, doing all these different things. And she came back next day and said, mom, I chickened out. I went and got a job. I'm so sorry. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Now I've got all this stuff for this business. What am I going to do with this business stuff? And would you just stop for a minute? And um, 
she's really cute. She's just really, really crazy. But, and so for for those of you that are listening, we're talking about her dog right now, not necessarily her, her daughter. Okay. Not her <laughs> no. dog, not her her dog just is jumping around and, and playing right now. She's not well, maybe her daughter's a little crazy and cute too. I don't crazy. know. But but we're talking she specifically is. about her dog right now. <laughs> yes, the dog just won't stop. Um and so I, I said, you've got to be kidding. And here I am. I just started all of this stuff for this business you wanted to do. So that left me with a decision to make. Am I going to trash what I had done to start Sergeant Bubbles? Or am I going to go through with it? And I decided I'm going to do it. Why not? And so I started a business of handmade soaps and lotions and bath bombs, scrubs, lip balms, lip glosses. We've got a men's line. We've got naughty soaps. Um, it's really a fun business. It's not your typical spa type business, but it is a self-care business because I feel like that's so important for people. You know, if you have a nice bar of soap or you have a scrub for your face or a mask for your face that you put on for 15 minutes and can relax, that can make all the difference in the world to how you feel inside and how where your tank is at. And it doesn't take long. It doesn't cost a lot. It doesn't take much. You don't have to go on some expensive vacation. You don't have to, you know, recharge your batteries that way. You can do it in small ways a couple times a week. And boy, does it make a difference. And Rebecca has been extremely positive and very supportive about Sergeant Bubbles. But that child has not made a single bar of soap since we started the actual business. So I have done it all on my own, which is totally fine. I I figured I have found that I really enjoy doing it. And I really enjoy owning my own business. And I really love my customers. I really like the interactions that I have. And it's starting to kind of an evergreen effect. It That now fills my tank because when I get positive feedback or I get a letter from a customer, that just blows me away and just brightens me up like you wouldn't believe. And awesome. all of my kids, Evan thinks that I work way too much because it pulls some of the attention away from him. And he is the attention king. But uh, both of Alex and Rebecca could not be more supportive and enthusiastic about Sergeant Bubbles, which is really nice. I'm going to need them around the holidays this year. So <laughs> it's it's been really nice that my kids are so accepting now that mom's doing something else. Well, I, I love the, the story arc that's, we're able to see here and how it's, it's reaching the, this climax. Now you, you now got this business that helps people scrub away the past, right. And find this new cleaner yes. version of themselves, a place of relaxation, a place of rest, a place that you are currently in and how you got here is, is so powerful. And even the fact that now this is helping bring your family back together again. And helping you guys all create this new identity as as a family unit and as individuals and helping propel you forward to this new identity. It's, it's almost washing away the past version of you and now this new version of you. You're no longer the mom of those kids. You're now the owner of that business. And that difference is huge. You know, I, I'm, as we're talking, you're smiling. As we were talking earlier, though, you had this worn down look of, this is who I am. And now as I'm looking at you, you're smiling, you're glowing, you're beaming because this is your new baby. It's the baby that you are bringing up from the beginning and you're already seeing it grow into something you could have never imagined. And that's, it's so powerful. Absolutely. And I had never thought about it like scrubbing away the past, but that's exactly what it's like. And it has been such a transformative process for me. I never thought that I was going to own my own business. You know, I never thought my kids were going to grow up and become positive members of society. Trust me, I didn't ever think that was going to happen. But it's just become so awesome. And things have really changed and really just fallen into place. And mm. yes, we've been through the mud, we have been through you name it, and we've been through it. But I couldn't be happier with the spot that I'm in now. Mm, so good. And sometimes you need to get the dirt on you to give you an excuse to be able to wipe it away, right? Wipe it away. You, yes. I feel like you've got this this amazing way of taking the pain, the hardship, and turning it into something that's good and amazing. And even like the the origin story of Sergeant Bubbles. Um, can you talk to people about that a little bit and the misspelling of Sergeant and, and all like all of that and how it's now become who you are in this business? It's the Rebecca came up with the name and we had just lost her beloved dog Sergeant. 
And a vet tech a long time ago when we took Sergeant in to have some shots done or whatever he was having done, the vet tech misspelled Sergeant. And so we decided to just keep it that way. And when we opened Sergeant Bubbles, every name we thought of was already taken. And so we just started putting two words together. And so she came up with Sergeant and we decided on Bubbles and that's, that's the name. And it's, it's really keep Sergeant with us. He was such a great dog. And it really reminds us that it's a home catering business, that it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's a family personal business. You awesome. Know? And so yeah. Sergeant, Sergeant is S-A-R-G-E-N-T. And again, all that stuff will be yes. in the show notes. So you can, you can click on the links and you can, you can order all kinds of things and all kinds of stuff just in time for the holidays, whatever you want to do, but you can click on the link and start to see some of these cool creations. You say there's, there's bath products, there's beauty products, there's naughty products. And uh, I'm there glad are. I, well, I, I don't even want to go there just thinking about <laughs> what some of that might be, but hopefully that'll encourage people to to hit the little click and try to explore a little bit. I, and I know, I know my audience, right. I was telling you before, and 70% of the audience are females and a, vet, a lot of those people are, are educators. So if you're a teacher and you're, you're listening to this and it's like your planning time, click the show notes. Once you get home, don't be clicking the show notes right now. Okay. <laughs> Cause we, we have no idea what's going to pop up in those Sergeant bubbles. So um, very cool. Very cool. It's all about self-care. It is all about self-care. And if there's something that you can think of that you want made that we don't offer, that's a big part of our business is doing custom creations for people. You want it. I will figure out a way to get it made. So that's awesome. And that's the fun part about it. I love taking care of my customers. I love, you know, I, I just love my customers. So if that's there's so some good. way that I can do something to make you happy, I'm going to get it done. So good. Uh, Kathy, you've got this incredible story. You know, we've picked up, we picked pieces of it apart and um, mm -hmm. it's so, so again, it's so nice and so, heartwarming to see who you are and where you are now. As you think about the journey of your life over the last, I'm going to say three decades now, the that have gotten you to this place where you are right now, and all the lessons that you've had to learn through it all, all the things that you've had to overcome. And I know there, there's probably thousands of lessons that we could peel out of this. But if you had to pinpoint one thing that you want listeners of this to understand one one thing that you want the listeners of this to, to grab onto as a, a lasting lesson for them to help them realize that they can overcome, that they can persevere, that they can get to this place where you're at right now. Can you can you pinpoint a thing and say, yeah, focus on this and you'll find some success too? I have two personal mottos. Go for and it. And in fact, one of them I have tattooed on my arm. I am the heroine of my own story. Mm. And my other one is never, and I tell my kids this all the time and they get so sick of hearing this, but never, ever, ever, I don't care what else is going on. Never, ever, ever give up. If it's something you want, grab onto it like a bulldog and don't ever let go. Your dreams are not going to chase you. You have to chase them. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to get a promotion, if you're trying to work out a family issue. If you're trying, don't just don't ever give up. You know, I thought that Evan was a lost cause for a long time. And had I given up on him, he probably would have been. But mm -hmm. now he's a great kid. He does what he's supposed to do. He's had some hard knocks with the semi truck accident, but he's still a good person. And I think if I had given up on him, that wouldn't be the case. You just mm -hmm. don't ever give up. I don't care. Never say die. Never. No matter good. how how much the odds are against you, no matter, no matter what it is, you just never say die. That's good. And that drives I, I, people nuts. No, I, but I'm thinking about the story of the prodigal son and the life that, that you've been able to see, you know, we, the prodigal son story is this story, of this wayward child that comes back home and yes. the banquet that's thrown for this, for the kid. And we don't look back and say, look at all the mistakes and you've got a penance to pay. It's just arms wide open. And I feel like you've led that life for your dreams, right? 30 years ago, you yes. never thought of opening a soap shop. You never thought of creating Sergeant Bubbles. What you thought of is I want to have, I want to be a mom to amazing kids that love each other and love me. You didn't know how you were going to get there. In the midst of it, you thought it was going to be impossible. You had kids in prison. You had kids that were doing self-harm. You had kids that were in, truly lost, according to the world. Yes. But now you're at this place where 
this thing that you created has helped bring your family back together again. Um, your dreams are finally coming to fruition because you didn't give up. And I, I absolutely love that story. I love where you are. I love the lessons you've learned. I love Sergeant Bubbles, and I'm hoping that people will start clicking that link furiously and help support you and your incredible family. Catherine, thank you so much for finding time today to, to share your story, being so vulnerable, so transparent. I know it's a story that when you were going through it, like you said, was embarrassing. It was a story that caused you to want to hide at times, but you're at this place now where you're willing to share your story to help impact so many others. So I appreciate you. If people want to follow you or want to get in touch with Sergeant Bubbles and they're too lazy to click the show notes right now or too too nervous to, can you just audibly tell them where to find you and where to find Sergeant Bubbles? Absolutely. You can find us at www.sergeantbubbles.com. And remember, it's S-A-R-G-E-N-T, Bubbles. And if you want to get in touch with me, there is a contact form on the um, website. Please feel free to drop me a message if you have questions or comments or want to talk to me or please feel free to get in touch with me. And then I'm also on Instagram and Facebook under Sergeant Bubbles. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, again, when you're home, click those links, start following and engage in the story of Catherine and her incredible family. Catherine, thanks again, listeners. Uh, reach out. We want to support you any way we can. So reach out to me, reach out to Catherine, continue that journey towards lasting learning.